two major reasons that you will see patients. The number one cause that patients come to see a physician is what? Anybody? Pain. Pain. The number two cause is fever. The other reason is fever. Any of you have, have kids? Anybody get a kid? Yeah, great learning model, aren't they? I recommend everybody get a kid so that you can study your medicine better. But, but fever, absolutely. As soon as you get a kid, you'll be at, the, at, the, at your doctor uh, surprisingly often to, to deal with fever. But as we lead into fever, um, which is by, uh, I'm sure you can figure out now where that's organized at, is in hypothalamus. Uh, we need to first talk about this hour just how the hypothalamus is put together. And then we'll start talking about the things that the hypothalamus does. And the two big areas are going to be neuroendocrine control and then autonomic control. And autonomic control is where we'll get to fever, and that'll be on Friday. So today, we'll first we'll just talk about how the hypothalamus is put together and the, the major roles and how it organizes homeostasis, okay? And then we'll just, uh, again, sort of the landmarks. And then the next hour, we're going to talk about uh, the basics of neuroendocrine control. So homeostasis, you all are familiar with what homeostasis is. That's just constancy of the internal environment. And the idea, then, is that you're really you're looking at the regulation of changes in body temperature, energy balance, et cetera. So this is all stuff that you're, you're familiar with. So none of this is really a big deal. One of the things that you may not necessarily think about, though, in homeostasis is that in, in certain conditions, such as when we have an infection, your body's homeostasis completely shifts in order to try to optimize your immune response, your reaction to this stressor, as well as make the environment as hostile as possible to any sort of invading pathogen. So that's why we get fever. The reason we get fever is that your immune cells actually proliferate best at that temperature, whereas bacteria don't proliferate well at, at, the, at, a, at a fever level. In fact, bacteria uh, uh, proliferate best at just slightly below normal body temperature. And so, again, that's the reason then that, that we shift homeostasis during an infection uh, or other conditions is in order to optimize our reaction response to that um, and set the conditions as, as unfavorable as possible to what that stressor might be. Now, this is the key, this is the key uh, sort of intellectual point, is this idea of set points. So the reason that your heart beats at whatever rate it is right now is because you have groups of neurons that actually encode that heart rate. And as the system is stressed, where you need more blood flow, then those set point neurons will drive heart rate either faster or slower, depending on what the, the various condition is. So set points, then, are basically groups of neurons, okay, that have specific discharge rates that are dedicated to a specific physiological process. So with that, again, coming back to the idea of fever, then we sh should expect that there's a group of neurons that encode body temperature, okay? And as body temperature needs to increase, then you have sets of neurons that are dedicated. They'll change their firing rate such that body temperature will be allowed to increase. The way that's done is by simply increasing autonomic tone. Okay? We'll get to, again, get to that. The reason the hypothalamus, then, is sort of considered like the, the chief uh, center for homeostatic control is because this is where the greatest concentration of nuclei with these set point neurons are. So that's why we're talking about hypothalamus first. So then sort of diagrammatically, this is how we have it. So we have the hypothalamus sort of sitting here, uh, encoding all these set point neurons, and then by controlling the autonomic nervous system and the neuroendocrine system then, we can modulate the way peripheral target tissues operate. And of course, then those tissues need to provide feedback back to the hypothalamus, so the hypothalamus knows what's going on out there in the periphery. And then as well, we have limbic brain nuclei that send strong inputs into hypothalamus. So we all know that autonomic, I mean, emotional states have really profound impacts on both autonomic function as well as a neuroendocrine fun function. So if someone's under a stress a lot, right, we all are very familiar with the idea that stress leads to, uh, first of all, you can usually see people have straggly hair and, you know, they're all oily and greasy, right? This, is, this was you guys last week, right? Is the exams coming up, okay? 
So then again, that's just that ramped up autonomic control, that ramped up neuroendocrine outflow um, is, is, again, driven by emotional inputs coming into hypothalamus. And then if you have any sort of outside stressors, okay, can directly activate, so infection in the periphery, uh, stress, again, registering into your limbic brain can alter the way the hypothalamus works, or body temperature changes would directly affect hypothalamus. So any of these stress stimuli will, again, sort of be uh, integrated in hypothalamus, and then will change these output pathways then to, uh, to try to restore things back to a homeostatic balance. Okay, hemisected brain, and what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on this section because that's where the hypothalamus we're going to see is. You all are already familiar, that is not a baby, that's a monkey. And so just sort of cutting away all the extra brain and then putting some outlines on all of this because you're going to see this diagram again and again, so I wanted you to see where it comes from. We then can start talking about boundaries of the hypothalamus. So first we'll do it diagrammatically, and then we'll go back and we'll, we'll look at this in sections of the brain. So boundaries. The superior boundary is the hypothalamic sulcus. The hypothalamic sulcus is the rostral continuation of the sulcus limitans. And so if the hypothalamus sits ventral to the sulcus limitans, what's that basically tell you the hypothalamus is? What type of structure is that? What, is the, what sits below the sulcus limitans? Motor nuclei, right? Motor nuclei. Dorsal to the sulcus limitans is our sensory nuclei. So as we look at this then, we know that the thalamus is above. That's a sensory nucleus. We've already talked about how all sensory information flows through the thalamus. Now we're ventral to this. So this is basically a motor structure. Rostral boundaries. So you have the anterior commissure, the lamina terminalis, and the optic chiasm. So this is the end of the, the embryonic neural tube. And so this is where then we have these big crossing structures run in the lamina terminalis. The inferior boundaries are the infundibulum, the median eminence, the tubercinarium. Now, these are um, appropriately confusing terms. Okay, so let's just talk about it for a second. The tubercinarium, and I'm not going to ever ask you to slice and dice this in subsections, but just so that you understand what the terminology means. The tubercinarium is you see the whole outpouching coming off the, the ventral part of the brain. That whole structure is the tubercinarium. And then as it tapers down, you then have finally the median eminence. And then as you taper down further, the infundibulum leading down to the pituitary. Sometimes you'll see this called the infundibulum. Sometimes you'll see it called the, the pituitary stalk. Then the posterior boundary is the mammillary bodies. So now let's take a look at that. So again, you have the optic chiasm in front, rostral boundary, the mammillary bodies as the posterior boundary. That whole structure there would be the tubercinarium. And then as you taper down, you get to the median eminence. And then finally, it's torn off this, that section. But then coming off would be the infundibulum or the pituitary stalk. Looking on a hemisected brain, you really don't see much other than the hypothalamic sulcus. You can see the anterior commissure. The lamina terminalis is that thin wall. Down below is a little optic chiasm. Then coming up, again, you can see the median eminence, tubercinarium, and then finally in the back, the mammillary bodies. You'll see this commonly as you move into clinics when you horizontal sections. So you can see Mickey Mouse, right? And very up, in, so that's the mesencephalon, the cerebral peduncles. Here you can see a little bit of the median eminence where it's tapered down, sitting right behind the optic chiasm. Moving up just a little bit, we can see the optic tracts going off to either side. And again, you can see the mammillary bodies here in the back. And so hypothalamus would be bounded by each of those. A little bit further up, again, you can see this whole area. Now is the hypothalamus. Further up still, coming to the same thing. And this, now we're starting to run into the, uh, again, the very top of the mammillary bodies. And then finally, now you're up into the, the midst of the hypothalamus. Last track then with the optic, I mean with the anterior commissure. You're going to typically see sections like this, okay? So the lateral boundary is the one thing that you're never going to be able to see on a section unless it's coronal like this. So the lateral boundary is the internal capsule, OK? You have the, the fornix that's diving down through. Here you can see the anterior commissure. Now, the fornix is going to be the, uh, your key. Is We're starting to look for nuclei in the hypothalamus. You'll always focus on the, uh, the, the fornix. I'll show you a section in just a section uh, that'll make it more clear why. But when you can see these vertical bands in the fornix, you know that you're anterior. And then the fornix is going to turn 
and start going back to the mammillary bodies, and it'll form a nice discrete little circular bundle. That's when you know you're in the middle part of the hypothalamus. And then finally, you'll be able to see the, the mammillary bodies, and you'll know you're in the back. So we'll, again, we'll go over those sections in just a, a, a routinely here. So again, you can see hypothalamus, it's all this area. Hypothalamic sulcus is about right there. Okay, optic tract on either side. Same thing, you can, you can see how the fornix still remains vertical, so we know that we're still anterior. This little area here, see how it's arcing? Anybody guess what that nucleus is called? The arcuate nucleus. It's amazing how we come up with these names. Okay, now you can see how the fornix has gotten all bundled up. So we're somewhere out in the middle of the hypothalamus. Again, you can see the hypothalamic sulcus. This lateral boundary is, again, the uh, internal capsule. And finally, we're in the back. We can see the mammillary bodies. And you can see the mammillothalamic uh, tract coming off. With, and it's reaching up toward the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. We're going to start talking about the zones. And so just to take a look at the figure where you have the zone. So right along the, the third ventricle, right, is surprisingly called the periventricular zone. And then you have between the, the fornix, the bundles of the fornix, and the periventricular zone, you have this medial zone. And then last, you have this lateral zone. Now, these are the areas that, that are, are, are probably the best organization uh, for you guys to focus on uh, because it really helps to define uh, this. There we go. It helps to define sort of the sub areas that are really important to you. And so you have this diagram. Uh, in your text, and this is where, again, sort of the, the general organizational principle. So as we go anterior okay, and posterior, right along the ventricle, you have the periventricular zone. That's really where you have a concentration of your neuroendocrine control nuclei. So they're going to be right along the ventricle. Okay? As you move then into the medial zone, then that's where your enteric systems are. So this is where feeding satiety nuclei will be found. And as you go all the way out lateral is where you have cardiovascular systems organized. Okay, so they're just sort of breaking down the body uh, by the different systems. The other big organizing principle is your anterior, these nuclei up here tend to drive parasympathetic tone up. So if you're going to slow the heart, if you're going to dissipate heat, that would occur in the anterior nucleus. If you're going to drive heart rate up, if you're going to uh, acquire heat, then you're going to activate the posterior part of the hypothalamus and increasing sympathetic tone. Okay, so just taking a look at these areas again. So we're all the way in the posterior area. You can use the fornix as sort of your boundary. So this will be the, the periventricular zone, medial zone, and then outside the fornix is the lateral zone between the fornix and the internal capsule. This is the slide, good. And so you see the same thing again here. So this gray smudge out here, so that's actually a track we'll talk about in the middle. The, the internal capsule ends sort of right there. So between the fornix and the internal capsule is the lateral zone. Right along the ventricle is the periventricular zone, and then this would be the medial zone. Same thing you can see from above. Okay, so the lateral zone would be here, and then periventricular zone right along the ventricle. So the regions now is sort of an, is the old way that sort of the hypothalamus was organized. And it's not terribly um, helpful as far as what the principles of organization are, other than it kind of gives you an area where you can sort of cluster some of the nuclei. So the regions are referred to as the anterior, the tubural, which is over the tuber scenarium, and then the posterior zone. So just taking a look at those real quickly here on a horizontal section. You would have the anterior zone, sort of the tuberal zone, and then the posterior zone. Now, how it's more helpful is when you consider what nuclei are in those. So as you look at the anterior zone, uh, a lot of the big nuclei that we're going to talk about again and again, the paraventricular nucleus. If there's one nucleus you, you definitely want to keep, you have to trade away all the rest of your hypothalamic nuclei and only keep one. You want to keep the paraventricular nucleus. We'll talk about this several times. Anterior preoptic, suprachiasmatic, this is circadian rhythms, we'll talk about this in a second, superoptic nuclei. These are all either involved in autonomic control or neuroendocrine control. Then have the dorsal medial, ventral medial, and arcuate. We're going to learn that all of these are involved in a big way in feeding satiety. And then finally, the posterior nucleus and the mammillary nucleus uh, tend to, to promote 
uh, sympathetic tone, uh, and we'll learn that the mammalian nucleus is involved in learning and memory. So the circuitry. Now, one different thing about the hypothalamus than you're used to is that we're going to have neural connections. You're used to that. But now there's also going to be humoral connections. So part of the way that the hypothalamus gains its information is by s sort of tasting the blood, t tasting the, the, uh, uh, the, the body fluids. And so the neural connections then are going to be involved. We're going to learn about the limbic circuits, the sensory and autonomic circuits, and then, of course, the, neuro, the neurohumeral connections. So this is a map I drew out for you, all the relevant, important spots that you need to know. And the straight line means it's a two-way two, two street. Okay? So the main pathway that interconnects the hypothalamus is the medial forebrain bundle. Okay? And it's, again, it's a two-way street running all the way from cortex down to the spinal cord. And so information flows both ways up and down this, this pathway. We'll take a look at that in a second. You're going to see uh, components of the circuit of tapes. This is where we're going to talk about, you're going to hear this, a lot about this in the, the limbic circuitry. Uh, again, part of it is a two-way street. The fornix actually is a bi-directional pathway. Other parts of this, this circuit are actually uh, in a straight line. The street of terminalis, you guys have seen this many times. This is one of my favorite names in the, nervous, in the, in the central nervous system. The ventral amygdalofugal pathway. I just think that sounds cool. I don't know why. Just, it's really neat. Interconnecting the amygdala with the hypothalamus. Dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. We're going to learn that that's probably the most important pathway for the control of the autonomic nervous system. We'll come back to that. There's a mammalotegmental and a, mammalo, and a, a mammalospinal tract, as well as a hypothalamic spinal tract. Okay? And then there's a spinohypothalamic tract. So anybody guess where the hypothalamus can you tell me in the spinal cord where do you think that spinal hypothalamic tract might be? Where do you think that might be? Where does it run? Anybody? Runs right along with the spinothalamic tract. Okay? It's just as the spinothalamic tract comes up and it starts to approach the diencephalon, part of the fibers just die ventrally and run down into the hypothalamus. So it all runs in that anterior lateral part of the spinal cord. And then last, we're going to talk about the retinal hypothalamic tract here at the end of the day uh, today, or actually the end of this hour today, uh, which we're going to find is involved in uh, circadian rhythms. So just taking a look at some of those pathways. So here you can see the, the fornix, probably a guy fornix because he's reaching back and grabbing those mammillary bodies. It's nasty. You can see the anterior commissure. And see how the fornix is your anterior? The fornix has this vertical orientation. And so as you cut it coronally, it's going to have those longitudinal stripes to it. As it turns then and starts going back through this, uh, the tubural portion of the hypothalamus, see how it turns and gets organized into these straight bundles. And then finally, as you see the, the, the mammillary bodies, you know you're all the way in the posterior area. So again, you can key on the fornix to tell you where you are, rostral, medial, or all the way to the back of the hypothalamus. Okay, and then I, I just put this in because you can see nicely how the, the mammalothalamic uh, tract comes up to the anterior nucleus of the thalamus. Looking again, uh, coronal section. So we have the, you can again see the internal capsule. Here's the hypothalamic sulcus. And so you can see this gray smudge out here is where the medial forebrain bundle will run, is in this, this lateral area of the hypothalamus, has that gray smudge color to it uh, because of the, uh, the medial forebrain bundle. The ventral amygdalofugal pathway runs right through this, this you would, as you look at the brain, you would call this the anterior perforated substance. You can see the optic tract, and again, sort of the, the arcuate nucleus, the median eminence down below. And then again, as you're all the way in the back, okay, you can see the mammillary bodies, you can see the mammalothalamic tract starting to come off there. All right, so as we get to the posterior part, now key on how the, the ventricle is closing off, and so you would have the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus, and the mammal, and the runs right here along with the medial forebrain bundle at this level. And then that tract is right here, just sitting on the cusp. Again, right below where the, the, the aqueduct is closing down. And then as you run back through the fourth ventricle, it stays right in this same spot all the way through. Now we're closing down, we're at the obex, so the fourth ventricle is closing down. And see how now the, the, the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus is going to get captured right ventral uh, to, the, to the ventricular system. 
And where that ends up then running, as we're closing up, it ends up then running right along, again, just below the central canal remnant, where it's going to be organized right where it can get into those intermediolateral cell columns. Okay, and this is in uh, cervical cord, where, and just right at the cervical th thoracic junction, where you can see now the, the, the uh, intermediolateral, this would be sympathetic preganglionics. But you remember that that's along like a sausage, right? And the cervical section is where the parasympathetic preganglionics, as well as down in the, the lumbosacral cord, that same sausage continues. You don't see it in those sections because the ventral horns get big with all those motor neurons and, and sort of obscures it. But the DLF is running right in this pathway, okay, right in here, where it has access, immediate access, right into uh, those target neurons that they're headed to. So it's just like the, the motor fibers run right along nearby uh, the motor neuron pools that they're headed towards. So again, that same organization holds together. Okay, looking at the circumventricular organs. Now, circumventricular organs, again, this is where now the hypothalamus is going to taste sort of the extracellular fluid, sort of monitoring then what the osmolality is, what your blood sugar is, et cetera. So these are just Fenestrated endothelial cells are in this area, and so the, the blood-brain barrier is leaky. And so your hypothalamus then can collect information coming from these different areas. Again, one of my other favorite terms, the organum vasculosum. That sounds like it should be naughty. But it's just the anterior part of the lamina terminalis where it's leaky, okay? You also have a leaky area in the median eminence. We're gonna, you're going to learn that uh, this site, is a key site for the entry of endogenous pyrogens, things that give you fever, tend to come in through this organum vasculosum. The median eminence is leaky, and that's where neuroendocrine inputs and um, uh, feeding and satiety, bloodborne inputs, access into the hypothalamus. The subfornical organ is, again, that one should, is like a nasty name. You know, what, what is coming up with this stuff? But we're going to find that uh, things like angiotensin, and blood osmolality are, are sensed in this structure. The area postrema, it's all the way here, uh, way back in the brainstem, uh, sitting uh, really kind of just ventral and posterior to the periaqueductal gray, is where uh, the, your chemotactic trigger zones, so things that make you nauseated, tend to enter into the brain uh, circumventricular system at this point. And then last, the pineal gland, uh, which we're going to hear in just a little bit, is related to circadian rhythms. And so all of these, these leaky areas, they may interact with different nuclei, but all, the, all those signals ultimately either completely humoral uh, or sometimes neurally mediated end up being integrated in the hypothalamus. So we're going to talk about uh, circadian rhythms. And so the key players here, circadian rhythms, are, going to, are important for a couple of things in the hypothalamus. Number one, um, it's time to wake up, right? So we'll talk about this in just a second. You guys all probably, given the choice, will spring out of bed at, what, 11.30 in the morning, something like that? <laughs> by, the by the time you get to be ancient like me, or God forbid, like poor Nakum Daphne, um, <laughs> then, you know, it comes to be 6.30 in the morning, and you're like, oh, my God, I've slept way in late. And so, it, again, we'll talk about the, the, the biology of that. Uh, but, again, just that normal sleep-wake cycle is set up by the way light resets the, the discharges of uh, hypothalamic nuclei. The other thing that this is important for, we'll talk about this more in the next hour, is the normal, act, uh, sort of the, the daily rhythm in your anterior pituitary hormone levels are all run by uh, your circadian rhythms. And so these two components are, are ones that we're going to talk about you know, typically. Uh, as well, I have a slide in a minute that panics students every year. See, you're already looking at it, freaking out. Don't worry about it. You don't have to memorize that. But it, we're, it becomes the same circadian rhythms is why you're going to see patients come to you with heart attacks, for some reason, always tend to occur in clusters right before dawn is the typical time for heart attacks to occur. As well, a lot of cancer therapies, just amongst others now, tend to be timed at particular times of day. Uh, because your body is best attuned 
to sort of re receive that treatment at given times of the day. And it's all based on these circadian rhythms. So let's just take a look at how that works. And so you have light striking the eye, sun's on. And so the light striking the eye comes along the optic tract. The optic chiasm sitting right on top of that, amazing uh, name again, suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is your chief uh, circadian pacemaker is in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the suprachiasmatic nucleus talks to the paraventricular nucleus that then talks down to the intermedial lateral cell column. So that would be the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus. And it, it, it is set, then uh, ultimately impacts on the superior cervical ganglion. And light holds that in an off state so that we don't have that signaling at all. As we remove the light, then the superior cervical ganglion would be disinhibited. And so it now starts to discharge. And it sends a projection to the pineal gland, releasing norepinephrine into the pineal gland. And the pineal gland then releases melatonin that works back into the hypothalamus on the suprachiasmatic nucleus to reset its, its rhythm. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus will normally operate in a 25-hour 25 25-hour on-off cycle. The light input simply resets everything back to a 24-hour light and trained uh, cycle. So that's what the melatonin is essentially doing. So I think this diagram is the one that you have in your, new, in your uh, notes. So the same sort of, uh, let's get the rest of it to go up there. There we go. OK. So. The pathway is referred to as the retinal hypothalamic tract. We already talked about that. It's basically running with the optic, optic tract. No, no fence, nothing else to, to uh, memorize. Uh, the, the, the slight point of departure is that you have these melanopsin-containing retinal ganglion cells. So these are the ones that are receiving light that are in signaling to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. This is a non-visual pathway. Okay, so there's no vision information in this pathway. This is simply light is on, light is off. That's all that those neurons, uh, these retinal ganglion cells, are detecting. So otherwise, they're not involved in the visual pathway at all. That then projects to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which again uh, influences the activity of the paraventricular nucleus. So already you have then this idea. I said that this is the chief pacemaker, right? Because this is the, the cells that now drive other subsets of cells. And so these would be called slave oscillators. And then that the paraventricular nucleus through the dorsal longitudinal fasciculus is going to suppress activity in the superior cervical ganglion. You lose the light, superior cervical ganglion can discharge, releasing norepinephrine into the pineal, which then releases melatonin. And the melatonin works back on this chief master pacemaker and regulates the, 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 uh, the expression of these different genes, which again, I think anybody could guess what clock is related to, right? The naming scheme is again, uh, uh, I think, imaginative. The good thing is that I'm not going to ask you, or I'm not even going to talk to you about all the details of the interregulation of these genes, OK? You should be aware that clock, BAML, cry, are related to uh, the regulation of circadian rhythms. But what the, all those specific interactions are, uh, I don't think is, is important for you to know. I think the important things for you to know, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the master pacemaker. And it influences then other nuclei that are yoked to it. And those would be called slave oscillators. And in this case, the paraventricular nucleus, in a sense, acts as a slave oscillator for the suprachiasmatic nucleus. We'll also find out that the paraventricular nucleus is an important site for the release of anterior pituitary releasing hormones. And so you can then see that the, the biology of that is just exactly like this, this regulation of melatonin secretion. But now other sets of neurons would be influenced now to change uh, the, the release of anterior pituitary releasing hormones. OK, I think that covers these. So a few disorders of circadian timing. Uh, phase shift, OK? So this is jet lag. It occurs because, and again, the details of this you don't need to know, but it's, there's simply uh, one set of genes changes its regulation quickly, whereas other sets of genes uh, reset 
slower. That's the simple explanation for what uh, jet lag essentially is. Your brain gets discombobulated, and one group of neurons isn't completely sure what another group of neurons is doing. Um, I found that anybody ever do it a, a good deal of travel? How many have traveled, flown to Europe a couple of times? What's the best way to reset your clock, do you know? Stay awake. Stay up in the light, and you'll reset your pacemaker, OK? If, God forbid, you get off the plane, you go to your hotel, and you go to sleep, you're going to be ruined for the entire week. So stay awake. So jet lag is cured by light. Right? We were talking about delayed sleep phase syndrome. You guys aren't teenagers anymore, but you're barely past that, I think, most of you. And so, yeah, jumping out of bed at the, the spry hour of 1130, uh, is, is again simply because uh, the, the whole uh, light dark cycle signaling in these genes simply becomes shifted uh, so that your body thinks that it's uh, time to wake up at 1030 and stay up till 2 um, and then wake up you know again with, with uh, a change in your the, the way your body's regulated to light and then as you get older right all of that falls apart and now whew, it's nine o'clock I gotta go to bed Right? So it's just uh, the change in the way uh, light influences the way the, the, the whole pacemaker system uh, works. And then you can have entrainment failure. Uh, to sometimes occurs in the blind. Now, this is the slide that, again, sort of freaks everyone out every year. I'm not going to ask you, what are you most predisposed to die of at 5.30 at night? OK? <laughs> Don't worry about that. But again, the the, the, the main concepts here uh, are exactly what we've just talked about. Your hypothalamus is changing the way it's functioning based on this light input in circadian rhythms. So that means that neuroendocrine levels are changing with the day as well. Your autonomic tone is changing through the day. Okay? Your body temperature changes through the day. And with all of those variables in place, that means that you have Chronomorbidities, so things like, where is it? Heart attacks, right? Right at dawn. Start getting up, moving around, is what I always thought. But in fact, what you, you'll find is if you do real careful studies, your blood pressure actually hits a little spike early in the morning. Um, and and a, a lot of the activating hormones are all released early in the morning. So. And these seem to be related then to these cardiac-related uh, uh, symptoms or problems or whoop, death. Okay, later in the evening, this actually is the the time when pain is seems to be worst, right? As people want to go to sleep, your pain limiting systems all turn off. But as well, at this later time in the afternoon, anybody, an athlete? How many athletes do we have here, or at least believe that they're athletes? When is your peak performance? Anybody know when is peak athletic performance in the day? It's about 5 p.m., not 7 a.m. Peak athletic performance is in the evenings. OK, so that's it for the sort of the structure. So again, let's just then cover what the main points are. Because these are the softball questions. This is where you guys are just going to knock the ball out of the park when you come to the exam, right? The nice, easy, I was alive in there, so I got all this right. So the boundaries, the boundaries of the hypothalamus, the dorsal boundary. Anybody remember what the superior or dorsal boundary is? Hypothalamic sulcus. And the hypothalamic sulcus is the rostral continuation of the sulcus limitans. I won't ask you that. I want you to know that the hypothalamic sulcus is the superior boundary. Okay? It's minutia that it's the rostral continuation of sulcus limitans. But that does tell you then that the hypothalamus is what kind of structure? Is it a motor structure or a sensory structure? It's a motor structure because it sits ventral to the sulcus limitans, the hypothalamic sulcus. The anterior boundary is the optic chiasm, the anterior commissure, and between those two is the lamina terminalis. That's the end of the rostral, the, the, the embryonic neural tube. Okay, The ventral boundary is basically the bottom of the hypothalamus. Okay, so the, the big structure would be the tuber scenarium, and that tapers down into the median eminence, and then that would taper down further into the infundibulum or the pituitary stalk. 
the posterior boundary is the mammillary bodies. So what is the one structure you cannot see unless you coronally section or horizontally section the brain? The lateral boundary, which is the uh, internal capsule. Okay, so those are your boundaries. Um, the rostral end of the hypothalamus drives tone in what component of the autonomic nervous system? Parasympathetic. The posterior part of the hypothalamus drives sympathetic tone. Okay, so we'll come back to that as we get to uh, both feeding and satiety and especially the control of body temperature. And then we have the different uh, zones. So the paraventricular zone we're going to find is related to neuroendocontrol. The medial zone is really where you're going to find nuclei related to control of enteric systems. And then the lateral zone is related to cardiovascular tone. And then last, we talked about just uh, circadian timing. The chief pacemaker is what nucleus? Suprachiasmatic, OK? Suprachiasmatic nucleus. Then any of the other nuclei that are responding to the suprachiasmatic would be considered a slave oscillator, OK?